the Good Old Grateful Dead cast, the official podcast of the Grateful Dead. I'm Rich Mahan with Jesse Jarno, exploring the music and legacy of the Grateful Dead for the committed and the curious. Welcome to the Good Old Grateful Dead cast. This episode continues our exploration of the music on American Beauty, dropping the needle on the first song on side two, Ripple. There's lots of great insight into this absolutely classic song in this episode. It may not have been a hit, but the boys certainly knocked it out of the park. Make sure to visit us at dead.net slash deadcast, where you'll find the 10 episodes from last season, which contain episodes about the eight songs on Working Man's Dead and a double play of two great bonus episodes you'll be sure to enjoy. You can also catch up or revisit with the five American Beauty episodes that have been released there as well. Also keep in mind, we post a dugout full of companion materials for each episode at our website, dead.net slash deadcast, and you can link from there to any and all of the podcasting platforms available. Please help this podcast by subscribing, hitting that like button, and if the spirit moves you, leave us a review. It's very kind. Thank you very much. It is the 50th anniversary of American Beauty, and the Grateful Dead have prepared a three-CD set reissue of this classic album. It's out now. It includes a pristine remastering of the album's 10 tracks, as well as an unreleased live show from February 18, 1971 at the Capitol Theater, which was mixed from the original 16-track reel-to-reel multi-tracks at Bob Weir's TRI Studios. Along with this impeccably mastered three-disc set, we also pitch you a new batch of Angel Share Audio. Out now are not only the full band acoustic demos for American Beauty, but also the rest of the studio outtakes from the American Beauty recording sessions. So be sure to check out the Angel Share American Beauty Audio at your favorite streaming service or download provider and put yourself inside Wally Hyder's in 1970 as the boys lay down tracks on this truly timeless classic album. Ripple is a special song in the Grateful Dead catalog, one that ascends to heights greater than the band itself. It's somehow more than a Grateful Dead song. And even grandparents who aren't fond of hippies can dig it. It has a universal appeal, it's been covered by a multitude of artists, and it never fails to lift your spirits. What makes it so special? Time to flip it up to our play-by-play analyst in the booth, Jesse Jarno. Seven. Earlier ones, because there's there was one before the one that I fucked up. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Flipping over American Beauty, we get to Ripple. If you are a deadhead, just those few seconds may have set your neck hairs on end. Or maybe even if you're not a deadhead. Ripple isn't just a classic Grateful Dead song. It's a classic song, period. Timeless in its power and simplicity. And it's far transcended the band that first performed it. One metric is that it's the only Jerry Garcia, Robert Hunter original included in Rise Up Singing, the standard folk music fake book that you may have crossed paths with at a summer camp or college dorm jam session. If you're a guitarist, you only need to know four open chords to play Ripple. Unlike many Grateful Dead songs, there are no tricks. There are no bridges with strange modulations, no extra beats, no tongue twisting. If you don't know the song, and are maybe only familiar with the most simple of guitar chords, you can still pick it up almost instantly. For Jerry Garcia and Robert Hunter, it was magic all the way through. Grateful Dead archivist and legacy manager David Lemieux. Ripple is a song that um, deadheads love, but I think non-deadheads, music lovers, dead fans, the, my brother of the world, Ripple is a song for everybody. And that's a song, I, I, you can't say that about all these songs. They're not songs for everybody. I'd like to think they are, but sadly they're not. But Ripple is a song, I think, for literally everybody, where you could play it for anyone who has never heard the Grateful Dead from any culture And that's a thing. And I think it lends itself very, very well. Neurotribe's author and friend to deadheads everywhere, Steve Silberman. Ripple is sort of the go-to song. You know, there's like, you know, crowdsourced versions from quarantine now. Everyone's weeping. Um, Ripple is sort of the go-to emotional center of the Grateful Dead's music in a way. Ripple is sung in schools, here by the fifth and sixth graders of the Barton Hills Choir from Barton Hills Elementary in Austin, Texas. It's a Ripple 
and played on bells here by the Cornell Chimes. It's very much a song for all seasons. Here's Jerry Garcia discussing it with Dennis McNally in the 80s from the audiobook version of Jerry on Jerry, five hours of Dennis's interviews with Garcia, available from Hachette. Ripple Eye is a little talky, even for me. Really? Yeah, I still have a moment or two. Whenever I sing that song, there's a moment or two I feel like, am I really a Presbyterian minister? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, I, it just it crowds me uh, just a little, but uh, it's, it's right within range. I mean, I could, I could just manage it, but if it were, if it had... One, one more, more. <laughs> right, if it had one more That's cautionary it. moment in it, you know, or whatever that uh-huh. is, you know, I'd have real problems with it. In 2003, Robert Hunter noted in his online journal, received an email today asking if Ripple was a spiritual. I replied, without question. Ripple in still water When there is no pebble tossed No wind to blow Ripple is deeply heavy, but filled with the most beautiful sense of light. Here's Grateful Dead guitarist Bob Weir. Ripple, everybody knows. You know, it's a sing-along kind of deal. Uh, Of late, I've been getting a lot of call to do that when I go visit people who were uh, on their way out of here. I'll bring a guitar to their bedside and uh, and play that for them because they can, you know, they don't have to struggle to remember the words and they can kind of sing along if, if they have the strength to do it. And everybody feels good about that. Let it be known There is a fountain That was not made By the hands of men The story of Ripple begins in May of 1970. Lyricist Robert Hunter was riding a creative high. Working Man's Dead was about to hit stores, and it was a breakthrough for Hunter and his housemate, songwriting partner Jerry Garcia. A very important factor in the wonderfulness of Working Man's Dead and American Beauty is the fact that Jerry and Hunter were living together in Larkspur, a floor apart. Hunter used to say that he'd be, you know, working out a melody upstairs, and then when he went downstairs to bring the lyrics to Jerry, Jerry would have already heard him working it out. He had already started improving it, you know, and so Jerry already had ideas by the time Hunter went downstairs to hand Jerry the lyrics to his songs. And they wrote a lot of their best love songs when they were living together in Larkspur. Here's one more slice from Dennis McNally's Jerry on Jerry audiobook, available from Hachette. He's so easy to work with, God. I, I couldn't hope to work with a guy that was more perfect. And plus, he has the, the ability to say what I would have wanted to say, you know? I, I mean, sometimes it's I can read things and I... I you know, it's he write, He can write for me, from my point of view, so effortlessly that, you know, I'm as transparent to him as a window pane, I'm sure. He knows me so well. Though known for much of his public career for being extremely private, Robert Hunter was rightly proud of his contributions to Working Man's Dead. As we learned about in the Easy Wind episode last season, he recorded promo spots for the album. The Working Man's Dead by The Grateful Dead, available on Warner Brothers Tapes and Records. In the weeks building up to Working Man's Dead release, he even visited radio stations in Boston, New York, and elsewhere. And then it was off to England. The Grateful Dead arrived in London in late May 1970 for their appearance at the Hollywood Festival. You can see the band's arrival in bonus footage for Amir Bar-Lev's Long Strange Trip. He told us a bit about that remarkable footage in our last episode about Candyman. Last minute crisis. Can't live without a last minute crisis this day and age. You can see the band D playing. We've posted the video at dead.net slash deadcast. With sound engineer Bob Matthews, Robert Hunter takes up the rear. Here's Hunter remembering the trip to WLIR DJ Dennis McNamara in 1978. First time I went over there, I had feeling of being an American that I'd never had here in an American writer has just put me in a real good perspective. I sat down one afternoon, a bottle of Retsina, a case of Retsina, oh, it was a case, I didn't drink the whole case, but I had all that I wanted. Uh, just bathing and being in England for the first time, you know, a lot of people dream about going to London, and I was one of them, and it was so nice being there. The 
band performed at the Hollywood Festival on May 24, 1970, their first show in Europe. Ask the film crew about it. Hunter stayed at the flat of Alan Trist, an old friend of his and Jerry Garcia from their days in Palo Alto. He'd since returned to London, but when the band finally made it over, he happened to be out of town. In 1970, for the Hollywood Festival, it so happened that I was on a research and writing expedition in the Gulf state of Sharjah at the time. My friend and publisher of the Middle East Economic Digest, Jonathan Wallace, had been commissioned by the Sheikh to create a glossy brochure to publicize his kingdom. So I wasn't there. Jonathan would later play a role in getting us to Egypt. Hunter stayed on in my flat for a while after the band returned to California after the festival. It was a story Robert Hunter liked to tell, and for good reason. Here's how he told it to Andy Geffen on WBRU in Providence in 1979. I wrote three songs that day. I wrote them in London. It's my first trip over, and I sat down with a bottle of Retsina, I think it was, or maybe it was two or three. No, I had a case of Retsina. <laughs> and, uh, and I wrote uh, Broke Down Palace, Ripple, and To Lay Me Down all at one sitting. Those three songs, Ripple, Broke Down Palace, and To Lay Me Down, the lyrics at least, uh, were written in one creative burst that Hunter had in my flat in London, near Kensington Gardens. That's an incredibly productive afternoon. Lyrics for the first two songs on American Beauty's second side, plus an indelible song that wound up on Garcia's solo debut, as well as in the Dead's repertoire. Here he is on WLIR in 1978. I just sat down, I think in an hour period, I wrote Ripple Broke Down Palace and To Lay Me Down, and I could have written more. I could, I could have just kept doing it, and uh, uh, I just said, well, that's certainly enough for the day. You know? <laughs> but I kind of wish I'd kept them on that day, though. That was one of the best streaks I'd ever had. In 1973, in the book, Turn It Up, I Can't Hear the Words, writer Bob Sarlin devoted a chapter to Hunter titled Robert Hunter, an Invisible Song Poet. Sarlin found a number for the dead's office in San Rafael. When he called, he asked the man who answered the phone, is Bob Hunter available for interviews? And received the unusual reply, speaking. I swear, Sarlin wrote, Bob Hunter is the easiest to find invisible rock star we have. It's a fascinating chapter. You can track down a used copy online, and it includes a little bit of what's probably one of only two joint interviews by Hunter and Garcia. In it, Hunter describes part of his writing process that might well describe his experience at Alan Trist's flat in London. He told Sarlin, Some of my songs are written during what I call peak experiences. For some reason, conditions are just right for me, and everything falls away, and I see for a bit. You just see and the stuff comes in. And if you've learned how to use a pencil, which is a real skill, to just sit there and to write and say, here it is, here it is. There's this presence sometimes, and I get a feeling that someone is looking over my shoulder, that what I'm writing is not going to be put into a book and shoved away and eventually lost somewhere. Here's Jerry Garcia talking about Ripple with Jim Ladd in 1981. Well, there's some songs that sort of uh, help you along, you know, they're sort of uplifting, you know, and that song is lucky, I mean, we were lucky with that one, and well, Hunter, you know, every once in a while he hits that something that's just a, a sentiment that's beautifully expressed, you know, or an idea, a human idea that's beautifully expressed. In songs like Candyman and Casey Jones, Hunter played with traditional folk imagery. In Ripple, his material was that of more traditional poets, deeply spiritual language with references to the Bible and timeless images that might be allusions to the work of others could just as likely be Hunter landing on the same phrase for his own reasons. David Dodd's indispensable book, The Complete Annotated Grateful Dead Lyrics, finds resonances in Ripple to Psalm 24, William Butler Yeats, Edward Gorey, and others. In fact, Ripple would find fans and writers. It was especially a favor of the Black Mountain School poet Robert Creeley, and David Dodd's book cites an incident involving Creeley, Ripple, and Richard Brodigan, author of Trout Fishing in America, and a Hate Street-era neighbor of the dead. David even emailed Creeley about it and got a response. Another point about Ripple, Bob Weir. The thing about Ripple is the, uh, the chorus is a haiku. I don't know if everybody knows that. Uh, Ripple in still water where there is no pebble toss nor wind to blow. It's a haiku. It has that kind of a point to it. It's one of those songs where once the song is done, there's nothing more need be said. You know, that point is made. 
it sort of demands a, a bit of space around it. There are two written drafts of Ripple that show a little more of Robert Hunter's process. We've posted images of both at dead.net slash deadcast, should you like to see them. In the 90s, Hunter scanned and posted a bit of the handwritten original on DeadNet. Above it, you can see the bottom of a few lines of other words. Either Ripple wasn't the first of the three songs written that day, or it took Hunter a few invocatory lines to warm up. It's possible to make out some of the first pass of the opening lyric. Instead of, if my words did glow, it begins, if my tongue were gilded. The phrase is crossed out, but the other verses appear pretty much as we know them, with some very minor variations. And there's also a typed lyric draft of Ripple on yellow-lined paper, unearthed by Nicholas Merriweather in the Dead's archive at UC Santa Cruz. It surfaced along with another extremely cool document that we'll get to in a future Deadcast. One of the things that really informs the archival profession is this concept of original order, which is when a, a record's creator puts things in certain arrangement, you need to pay attention to that because that tells you a lot about how the records were created, how they were used, all of that. With the materials that we got from the Grateful Dead, most of that original order had been lost. It had gone through a bunch of different moves. It had just been jumbled together. So these were very much just one of those cases of archival serendipity. They turned up in a completely unlikely set of otherwise unrelated file folders, and I said, oh my God. On the Ripple draft, next to the lyrics, are the chord changes for the song in Jerry Garcia's handwriting. Jerry has added numbers next to each verse. There's an unused verse all the way at the bottom, which Garcia has slotted to come second to last. The wisest man is but a pilgrim. He will not claim to know the way. He will not promise dreams of glory. His words are few and his ways are kind. Perhaps this is what Garcia was remembering when he said he bordered on feeling like a Presbyterian minister. Jerry had a particular editorial eye and approach, and Hunter had come to trust that. In that wonderful interview that Blair Jackson did with both Hunter and Garcia, you very much get a sense that they had a shared sensibility, a shared love for what they called the, you know, the elliptical old folk tale, you know, a folk song that lost words, lyrics, verses, you know, morphed over time in in the way that folk songs do. And they both just loved the kind of mystery that those illusions and omissions over time gave to a song. And I think Hunter trusted Garcia to go through and (laughs) kind of create that same sense of mystery and that same sense of, you know, uh, a tale hinted at as opposed to explicitly adumbrated. Something else fascinating, on the typewritten lyrics for Ripple, one can see other chords bleeding through from the other side of the page, also in Jerry Garcia's handwriting. I reversed the image and sent it over to some friends to see if it resembled the draft of another song. Here's Jacob Cohen, visiting assistant professor of musicology at the Oberlin Conservatory and Dead Freak. Jake explained what these chord changes might or might not be, and how the musicological field of sketch studies applies to the dead. There's no rhyme or reason to sketches. They're not intended for public consumption, so they don't need to be understandable to anyone except for the author. And we don't know why they do them either. You know, Was it a, an idea that they liked? Were they specifically working on a song? Were they drafting a song? Were they trying to, like, write something down while they remembered it, you know, we, we just don't know. So what scholars generally will do when they're working with sketches is try to piece together whatever they can and say whatever they can without saying anything too conclusively. You know, I look at that sheet and I cannot say for sure anything about it except that it is some chords written on the back of Ripple. The things that I definitely see are, it looks like it says ballad up near the top. And on that same line, we see something that looks like it says D parentheses too fast. What we see for sure is that it says G E minor with two in parentheses and then D. So G E minor, E minor, D is basically how to lay me down starts. So, you know, to lay is under G, me down is on E minor, and then 
wants is D and then goes to C, more, right? And can we say for sure that that is Jerry figuring out or writing down the chords to, to lay me down? No, we can't. What we can say is that those are the chords to, to lay me down. And so that suggests that this notation that he has, these chords that he has on the back of this are possibly either an early version of the song that would become To Lay Me Down or some chord changes that he just liked that he returned to when he was writing To Lay Me Down and saw, okay, I liked this, I'm gonna use that, but I'm also gonna use something that I didn't write on this page because there's a lot in that song that is not written on this page. There's also a bunch of things on this page that aren't in that song at all. Another thing we can say for sure is that Robert Hunter often spoke of writing the lyrics to Ripple and to Lay Me Down in the same sitting, along with Broke Down Palace. But as Jake says, there are many chords on this page that don't have anything at all to do with the song that became to Lay Me Down. It's perhaps more like the dream of a fragment of an outtake of a demo. You can roll your own, but let us know if you do. And I'm looking at this one more time, and I'm realizing this is interesting. So the chords that are to Lay Me Down are and and it's not even like all of to lay me down it's literally just like the sort of opening melody right are on the top and then there's a bunch of space between that top part and the next writing in that style in that moment so we could be looking at two different song ideas here so it might be like two different dreams of fragments of outtakes of demos Jake and I spent like an hour on Zoom batting around theories. All of them fun, none of them conclusive. Okay, back to Ripple. Ripple would be a truly international song, and that's not a coincidence. There's something about being in a foreign country that makes me more Western than I am here, Robert Hunter noted to Blair Jackson, adding that the lyrics for Tennessee Jed were written in Barcelona. For Ripple, the words were written in London in May 1970. The music was written in Canada slightly more than a month later. Here's Hunter on WBRU in 1979. I gave them to Jerry when we were, uh, I was back, uh, we were doing a Toronto train trip, a train trip through Canada, and I gave him the lyrics then. He worked out the music for it, sitting on a uh, train track in uh, Winnipeg, as a matter of fact, <laughs> for Ripple. And Garcia speaking with Jim Ladd in 1981. That song just flowed out. It actually came out of a guitar that uh, Weir had. I picked it up and started playing it, and it's like that tune just wanted to come out, you know? And that, uh, that little melody, it's as though it were always there. I love that story. Another time, Hunter placed them in Saskatoon. It means the words grew music between June 30th and July 3rd, 1970, well on the Festival Express tour. And if the song was written in Saskatoon, between Winnipeg and Calgary, it means it was written during the absolutely epic multi-band party and jam that resulted in absolutely epic multi-band hangovers. A new concept for much of the Grateful Dead. Check out the great documentary Festival Express for much more about when and where Ripple finished itself. In case you're wondering, the guitar Weir was using was a custom Guild Archback F50 with an extra-large peg head used through the band's acoustic sets in 1969 and 1970. Thanks to Michael Clem for this info. Ripple's live debut likely doesn't exist on tape, and the same goes for the earliest versions of several other songs that would appear on American Beauty. Grateful Dead archivist David Lemieux. The Grateful Dead's archive doesn't have a lot of gaps in terms of missing material. The big missing gap is from, uh, you, you could almost pinpoint it to July 16th. Owsley Stanley was the Grateful Dead's first sound engineer. You can learn a lot more about him in our special Bear Drops episode from last season. He started with the band in 1966 while they practiced downstairs from his LSD manufacturing operation. The band and the Bear parted ways, and he was eventually busted at one of his LSD labs in late 1967. By the end of 1968, he'd returned to the Dead's mixing board and his quest for better live sound. He taped nearly every show between late 68 and the summer of 1970, what Bear called his sonic journals. He'd so far avoided jail time, but when the dead were busted in New Orleans in January 1970, just before the start of the Working Man's Dead sessions, it was a parole violation. They went back to California, 
And that's when Bear was given the rule that he wasn't allowed to leave the state of California, which really stank for Bear. It stank for everybody. It stank for the Grateful Dead. And it stank 50 years later for tapers, because what that meant is anything outside of the uh, state of California wasn't recorded by Bear. July 16th, 14th and 16th, the Grateful Dead play in San Rafael at uh, Pepperland, at Litchfields, at um, Euphoria Ballroom, whatever you want to call it, right a block from Phil's restaurant, from Phil's place in the Canal District. And the Dead play there with Janice, no less. And then I guess, I, I don't know if it was quite this simple, but I think it was, Bear went home after the show back to Richmond, just over the bridge, and was arrested and taken away for about two years. And for that time, not only was he not recording California shows, he was not recording anything. And so uh, it took a while for the Grateful Dead's crew, I think, to recover from that blow. It wasn't just, you know, people being, you know, uh, unconcerned with recording. I'm sure it was still a big priority, but, you know, you're down a man. And this was a crew that was incredibly small to start with. And it wasn't until the Legion Stadium in El Monte, and that was December 26, 27, 28th of 1970. That's when the crew started recording quite regularly. And that's when the collection starts becoming quite a bit more complete from those shows onward. The last show Bear recorded before going to jail was on July 16th. Two weeks later, the Grateful Dead bailed on the Medicine Ball Caravan Tour, opting to stay at home and record what would become American Beauty. After that, the tapes get really blurry for a month. There are newspaper listings for a number of shows, a few nights of the side project Mickey and the Heartbeats at the Matrix, which maybe didn't happen, followed by a few nights at the Lion's Share in San Anselmo with the new Riders of the Purple Sage headlining over the acoustic dead, which definitely did. There are a few tapes with dates from these few weeks, not made by the Dead Sound crew, but it's hard to trust how most of them are labeled. No matter when or where the tapes are from, though, Ripple doesn't appear on any of them. The first Ripple that we know about on tape appears on the Angel Share, American Beauty. It didn't have its final name just yet. Let's listen to a bit of that. After all, it's Ripple. Hand me down provisionally. And my tunes were played on the harp on the strum. Did you hear my voice coming through the music? Would you hold it near as it were your own? It's a hand-me-down. The thoughts I broke in. Perhaps they're better left unsung. I don't know. Don't really care. Let there be songs to fill the air. cup is empty If your cup is full May it be again The song itself is as fully formed as Garcia and Hunter's story suggest, though it's got a slightly more driving drum part and feels a little bit faster. The demo version we just heard was probably recorded August 6th at Pacific High. Of the surviving tracking sheets from the band's first attempt to record American Beauty, Ripple is one of the only two that are dated, August 9, 1970. Perhaps because of its apparent simplicity, it must have been one of the first songs they tried. Listening to the band's first attempts to record it, though, it becomes obvious just how much of the final version relies on the magical dynamics they wouldn't achieve until they got to Wally Hyder's. There are no drums at all in the Pacific High version, nor Pigpen for that matter, 
just Garcia, Weir, and Lesh on acoustic guitars and electric bass. When the tape fades in, we can hear them discussing their strategy for recording. Because the song's vocals start with the first note, they will begin each take by playing a few instrumental measures and then pausing, so Jerry can have guide notes when he overdubs his vocals. Well, let's play the rhythm for a little while, then we'll stop it. That way the pitch will be there with only a bar interruption. The band recorded four complete instrumental takes of Ripple at Pacific High on August 9th and chose the first of those to overdub vocals. You can hear how that little strategy sounded in action. Two. Two. Let's do the chord. Let's do the whole number. Yeah. If my words did glow with the gold. Jumping ahead slightly, here's how their overdubbed vocals sounded. You who choose to lead must follow. But if you fall, you fall alone. If you should stand, then who's to guide you? If I knew the way, I would take you home. Da 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 It's only a little different from the final recording, still a little faster, but it just doesn't have quite the right glow. We asked Bob Weir what he recalled about the abandoned sessions at Pacific High. Back in those days, uh, we'd write a song, and then we'd find that if we took it out on the road and played it for folks, it'd grow a face. And I think that's probably what happened with those songs from the Pacific High sessions, that uh, we recorded them right as we had written them or as we're, we were writing them for that matter. And then we'd do a tour or two and the songs would come back and they'd be much fuller. And so we started over. Back in those days, time was extremely compressed too. After the Pacific High sessions, the band didn't play a tour or two and start again, but they did play a few shows. First, there were three nights at the Fillmore West, which only survive as audience tapes, but include the first surviving live versions of Ripple. There's a KQED special they taped sometime that week, followed by a pair of acoustic dates in L.A. with the New Riders at the newly opened The Club in L.A. No tapes of those shows seem to survive at all, but it's a pretty good bet that the band performed Ripple and helped it grow its face. It's unclear if the actual American Beauty session started before or after the shows in L.A., but here's what Ripple sounded like with its face and a good deal more production. And here, with the new 50th anniversary remastering. It's a hand-me-down The thoughts are broken Perhaps they're better Left unsung I don't know Don't really care Let there be songs To fill me the song is slower, and the tempo finally feels just right. There's a drum part now, Bill Kreutzmann keeping time with a gentle shuffle and giving it just the tiniest bit of swing. The American Beauty version of Ripple has two particular bits of studio mojo, and both come with excellent guests with excellent stories. The first is David Grisman's mandolin. Ripple in still water. When there is no pebble tossed, no wind to blow, reach out your hand. David Grisman was an old friend of Jerry Garcia's. A few dead casts back, when we dove into Friend of the Devil, we learned about his and Garcia's shared roots in the bluegrass world. They'd stayed loosely in touch. And in the summer of 1970, Grisman relocated to the Bay Area. And I had a friend, Julie Silver, who lived in San Francisco, 
And somehow she had heard about there was going to be a softball game in Fairfax, California, between the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane. We went down there and say hi to Jerry. That's right, a softball game. We now interrupt our regularly scheduled deadcast about Ripple to present this brief history of the Grateful Dead's very own softball team. According to David Nelson, they earned their name after Bill Graham's squad bested them a few times, and the band brought in some outside help. To tell the story of the Dead Ringers, batting first, we have the Dead Ringers' ace first baseman, Bob Weir. We had a pretty good little uh, softball team. It was uh, We brought in a couple of ringers from uh, from Pendleton, Oregon. This one kid, uh, Gary Harover, big kid. He got drafted by the Cleveland Indians, I believe, uh, out of high school in, uh, in Pendleton, Oregon, where a lot of our crew came from. He and Rex Jackson, who was another big kid from Pendleton, every time they came to bat, uh, they popped the ball out of the park. And so we were tough to beat. I didn't get the ball out of the park all that often, but uh, I, I got on base a lot. Had a pretty good arm, but I played first base, so it didn't matter. One of our other Pendleton guys, uh, Ramrod, had a good arm, and we put him on third base. I remember one time uh, Bill Graham couldn't just let us have a baseball team and not challenge us, so he put together a team out of his guys, and we were just we shall act them. There wasn't much contest. So after two or three innings, we said, hey, listen, let's call that off. Everybody line up and let's choose teams. And I was playing first base. Somebody popped a fly up on the first base line. And, you know, I, I didn't figure I had to call for it because it's, it's pop fly on the first base line. And, uh, and that's my job. Come in a little bit and I run into uh, Bill Graham, who was busy trying to glory hog it a, a bit, as was his way. And we had a nasty little collision there, and, and he landed on the ground, and I guess broke his shoulder. From that point on, about every other time we'd run into each other, he'd, you know, he'd, he'd pull his shirt down and show me where, you know, his shoulder was, had been broken and all that kind of stuff, trying to make me feel bad. <laughs> and I tell him, listen, Bill, that, you know, it was my job to catch that fly ball. What were you doing on the first base line? That was the nature of our relationship. Bill Graham was a great guy. Something of a crook, but a great guy. One occasional member of the softball team during the summer of 1970 was electronic composer and jazz pianist Ned Lajan, who contributed to the American beauty track Candyman. Yeah, 1970, I was really surprised and happy to know that the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane had a friendly rivalry that was not musical, but was baseball. And they used to play these games in Fairfax, where I lived with Phil, and then I moved eventually. And the field is still there. The game that I played in, I played center field. Phil was to my left, which would be right field, and to my right was Jerry in left field. And I believe Ramrod was the pitcher. Uh, I'm pretty sure Ramrod was the pitcher. For the airplane, Kantner was the pitcher, and every time they were ahead, he was happy. And every time they were behind, which had something to do with his pitching, he would threaten to quit. And Grace got to bat, I think, once or twice, but she was just the obscene cheerleader in the bleachers. They had those little bench bleachers. It was so great to share with musical friends something outside of music like that, so American. I played baseball, uh, softball and football, and ran track in high school, but I, the softball and the, and the football I played, we just met after school and played in an empty field. I was never good enough to do that. I was often picked last. Okay, Here I was now on a team where I wasn't picked last or even second last. I was better than Phil and I was better than Jerry. <laughs> the, crew, the crew was better than me, but I, you know, but again, being an MIT, you know, scientist nerd, that was like, wow, I've gotten out of, you know, last place. The ball would be hit to Jerry, a, a high fly ball, and he would run around with his hands up in the air like he was praying to some rain god, you know, some Hopi rain god or something, you know just two-stepping around, and then the ball w with his glove up, and then the ball would just fall, <laughs> plop, right on the grass right next to him. Bob Weir concurs with Ned's assessment of Jerry's fielding skills. Uh, it wasn't his strong suit. So I, we put him at shortstop for a little bit, and that didn't work so well. You know, I, I saw him chase a ground ball and just throw his mitt at it. But a lot of the airplane family were there and the Grateful Dead family were there. And it was just, you know. And to, to put this in some context, 
1968, when I studied with Chomsky and I started thinking about electronic music as evolutionary and generative, okay? This was the same year that Martin Luther King was killed and Bobby Kennedy was killed, and our world was basically turned upside down. As I think it was the Firesign Theater said, everything you know is wrong. And so in 1970, to play, play baseball with my psychedelic friends had some normalcy to it. And these hippies were still Americans with some of the same American traditions. Pigpen had, had the uh, good sense to not turn out for the team, but he would sit behind the plate and call balls and strikes. He did his best to be impartial, but there was some back and forth there as well. There are two brief newspaper items about matchups between the Dead Ringers and the Jefferson Giraffes at Contrati Park in Fairfax, and they're both worth citing in full. Unfortunately, neither comes with box scores. The first is from a nationally syndicated August 29th Popwire column by music journalist Lisa Robinson, now a contributing editor at Vanity Fair. She noted, The Jefferson Airplane are celebrating their fifth birthday with a perfect record of losses this season by their baseball team, the Jefferson Giraffes. The Jefferson Airplane Giraffes have been defeated by the Grateful Dead Ringers of San Francisco. The second report comes from the October 8th edition of Herb Cain's own nationally syndicated column, It's News to Me, and indicates that Bill Graham got a bit of mileage out of the old shoulder injury. It reads, Fillmore Bill Graham is groaning around with a dislocated shoulder after pitching the Grateful Dead softball team, the Dead Ringers, to a 17-16 victory over the Jefferson Airplanes giraffes at Fairfax. You see, there's more than one way to go on grass. Graham suffered his injury after a giraffe ran into him with malicious intent. Well, yeah, you know, we used to beat most everybody. I don't recall getting beat much. If things got close, we'd bring in another ringer. We didn't, we didn't show up with the intention of, uh, of ever losing. David Grisman may be the world's most legendary mandolin innovator, but he's a lousy sports reporter. What the hell, dog? I don't remember who won, you know, but... Uh... <laughs> I remember talking to Jerry. He asked me if I'd come and do some overdubs on this record they were making. That was, I think, on a Saturday or a Sunday, and Monday, I believe, was the session. American Beauty co-producer and engineer Stephen Barncard. Grisman came in just all of a sudden, you know, I say, like, who's this guy, you know? And then he, you know, oh, okay, mandolin player, cool, you know. And and then he did his little, you know, thing. And, and, and then I said, okay, great, can we get another one? Uh, you know, I, I had in mind the, the, the putting that one. I just, I like space. I like stereo. And, and so this might be a cool stereo to have the mandolin do the, something on both sides. That was my idea. I take full blame for that. It worked really well. So I got to put in my ideas. It was a real, a real great give and take. I think they probably had me harmonize. Yeah, I harmonized the first part. Yeah, like double stops and tremolo. There was pretty uh, much a kind of formula at that time, which I, a tremolo on the chorus. I liked the tunes, and it was well-suited for what I was doing. Only a few weeks after Grisman recorded his parts for American Beauty, he joined the band on stage at the Fillmore East. As Jerry Garcia recalled to the British magazine Swing 51 in 1983, Dave Grisman and Dave Nelson were both there, so I had them both come out. See, Grisman does twin parts on Ripple, a double mandolin part. So Grisman just taught Nelson the second part. We had the actual full thing, twin mandolins and everything, and we were able to do Ripple with the original instrumentation on the record. Sadly, that recording falls in the gap not covered by the Grateful Dead's tape vault, though the Fillmore East stage crew made a recording that circulates in trading circles. There was one other part of the studio version of Ripple that gives it an extra something. We'll take the scenic route to that part as well. Here's Sam Cutler who was the tour manager for the Rolling Stones in 1969. After Altamont, he went to work for the Grateful Dead. You can hear more from Sam in our Cumberland Blues episode from last season. I went there, you know, to Wally Hyders a couple of times, and it was all good, it was all cooking. For a tour manager, studios are boring. There's nothing going on. You know what I mean, man? It's like, yeah, okay. You know, you know what the band's doing. The band's making an album. You know where they all are. Somebody might call you up and say, where the fuck is Keith or somebody's supposed to be here? I think their car broke down or whatever, you know what I mean? But by and large, there's not much to do in the studio. So as I say, I always felt a bit like a spare prick at the wedding in studios and not much to do. So I'd call him, say hi, 
have a little listen. Somebody might play me something back, but, you know, it hadn't been uh, equalised or it hadn't been mixed, you know, so it's all very rough. I'd rather listen to the test pressing. Even with the Rolling Stones, I didn't spend much time in the studio, man, you know, other than, you know, with the Rolling Stones, maybe just to make sure that the Everyone was cool, you know. Keith wanted a bottle of booze or whatever. Somebody wanted sandwiches, whatever. Other than that, there wasn't much to do. Although I did play the car horn on Country Honk, one of my more sophisticated contributions to um, 20th century music. But I was busy, you know, um, on other things, you know. Getting gigs together, basically. You know what I mean? And sitting on the fucking phone 23 hours a day. I remember Ripple. I remember Ripple. I remember hearing that at the rehearsal hall. And then I was actually in the studio when they added everyone. We all sang at the end of it. Da, la, la, la. That was lovely. Yeah, that just seemed, that was such a lovely song. I mean, to this day, I think it's one of the most beautiful songs of the Grateful Dead. And, uh, very, very special. La, da, da, da. La, da, da, da. That makes Sam Cutler the answer to a rock and roll trivia question. Who is the only person to appear on both the Rolling Stones' Let It Bleed and the Grateful Dead's American Beauty? As for the other voices in the Ripple Corral, co-producer Stephen Barncard. I'm trying to remember. It was definitely some women there, and it was a lot of people, and it could have been some of the people from The Office. It could have been David and Bonnie Parker, who eventually wrote checks, you know, when I worked when I worked for the band, or... Old ladies, probably. You know, I you know, I don't know if Frankie was around then. I I didn't know the band at all. I only knew Jerry. When we did the record, I didn't know Phil. I didn't know anybody except and Ramrod, and I remembered him. And I'd done overdubs with Jefferson Starship and with Bruin Shipley. The singers included members of the band's office staff. One person singing was definitely Eileen Law, housemates with Bob Weir at the Rucka Rucka Ranch. It was there, only a few weeks earlier, that she'd given birth to her daughter Cassidy, as Weir had worked out the chords for the song that would bear her name. Later, Eileen would be familiar to Deadheads as the voice of the band's official hotline. Thank you for calling the official Grateful Dead West Coast hotline number. This is a new message as of March 29th. The Grateful Dead spring tour is completely sold out, and there will be no tickets sold at the door for any spring tour concerts. So please, if you don't have a ticket, don't come to the concerts. Thank you. The Grateful Dead will play May 5th and 6th at the Cal State Dominguez Hill Soccer Field in Carson, California. Dead archivist David Lemieux. Eileen had told us about the studio version where, as Sam told you, that lots of people were mic'd up for that chorus. Eileen had told us about that, the chorus at the end, and at the Fillmore East... In April of 71, when they played Ripple, a bunch of the family members, Eileen, I can't remember who else, there were three or four women backstage with the band, and they mic them up backstage for Ripple. And we actually did an isolated track of that and played it for Eileen. We brought her into the studio because she had told us the story and we thought, wow, like we'd never heard that before. And I, I knew the tape from, they, they did uh, 428 and 429, they played it. We listened to that ripple and I didn't hear it, but we listened to the multi-track and it was on there. When you listen to Ladies and Gentlemen, The Grateful Dead, they are on that. And it's very subtle because they weren't Mike Loudly and, and they were backstage. They were, uh, they were behind the curtain. They weren't visible to the public, but they did it. And that's when they dropped Ripple after that. <laughs> Ripple, April 29, 1971, 
the band's last show at the Fillmore East from Ladies and Gentlemen, The Grateful Dead. American Beauty would be one of their most enduring albums, and Ripple was one of its key songs, leading off the second side. One fan is pavement guitarist Stephen Malkmus. Number one for me is Ripple. It kind of reminds me of Michael Hurley, and I like the trippiness and simplicity of the lyrics. Not simplicity, but just... I mean, maybe the end, I don't really love the da-da-da-da-da, da, everyone singing that at the end, but just the way it starts and the naturalness and sweetness of it. Sort of got a, yeah, Raccoon Records, um, very Marin County or even North. There's something about it that just, you know, when I just listen to the album today, you know, I'm just like, that's it, you know. That's obviously a classic, right? They've played it many times and, and or do they play it live a lot? After the band stopped doing acoustic sets in November 1970, the same week American Beauty hit stores, Ripple only had a very brief life with the Electric Dead, four surviving versions from 1971 before it disappeared for nearly a decade. But when the Dead briefly revived their acoustic sets in 1980, Ripple was right there, with the band sometimes even encouraging the audience to sing along during the ending. Here's how it sounded on Reckoning. This version was recorded September 26th, 1980 at the Warfield Theater in San Francisco. I don't know, don't really care, let there be songs, fill the air. That's Otis. The only real change in the arrangement is the arrival of Brent Midland, replacing Phil Lesh in the harmonies, with his baby grand piano mimicking David Grisman's rippling mandolin. The special mojo in the reckoning version of Ripple is Otis, Bob Weir's dog, who wandered on stage during the performance. You can hear more about those 15th anniversary shows in our Deadcast bonus episode called Dead Behind, Dead Ahead. Here's how Jerry Garcia remembered the revival of Ripple to radio host Jim Ladd. It was a real great experience doing it, uh, you know, performing it for people. It was such a flash because people hadn't heard us really perform it very much. When we did, when we were performing acoustic, we didn't really perform very often, you know, and we didn't do it for a very long period of time. And and we never did perform that song very much because it was sort of difficult for us to do. It used to be harder for us to do. It's like such an acoustic, I mean, it's... Doing it was really a rush. I mean, it really, it, it raised the bumps on good nights. When the Grateful Dead stopped doing acoustic sets in 1981, Ripple disappeared with them, with one exception. On September 3rd, 1988, in Landover, Maryland, the Dead played it electric, part of a double encore. One piece of commonly held Deadhead folk knowledge, and actually true, is that this performance came about as the request of a dying fan. Archivist David Lemieux. It's unfortunate that it's a song that was around for such a short amount of time, 70, 71, the acoustic stuff in 80, and then that one time in 88 that I was fortunately at, that um, one of the many, many dead shows I saw, a lot of very vivid memories and a lot of blur. And I think the most vivid memory I have was a shakedown street I saw the dead play in 1989 and Ripple, September 3rd, 88. And it was because I knew the gravity of what I was seeing, that I was seeing the Grateful Dead play Ripple for the first time. And I remember my friends who didn't get into that show, and I remember trying to make them feel better by saying, oh, I bet they'll play it in Philly, and then again at the Garden next week. I knew they wouldn't. I had no idea that it was the Make-A-Wish story. I had no idea about that, but I do remember thinking that this was a one-off. I had no idea why, and uh, and that was it. We weren't going to get Ripple again, and we never did. Dennis McNally's authorized biography, Long Strange Trip, adds one other piece of detail to the 1988 version of Ripple. Perhaps to provoke him into playing it, Bob Weir bet Jerry Garcia $10 that Garcia couldn't remember the lyrics. Weir lost the bet, and apparently never paid up either. But he clearly hadn't been keeping up with the set list from Garcia's solo shows. Though The Dead didn't play an acoustic set again after an October 1981 show in Amsterdam, where they played Ripple, of course, Jerry Garcia began playing regular acoustic sets six months later. Ripple was often the closer, sometimes even after Goodnight Irene. It was a favorite in his duo sets with John Kahn from 1982 to 1986, with the Jerry Garcia Acoustic Band in 1987 and 1988, 
and with David Grisman between 1991 and 1994. They even rehearsed it briefly with David Grisman quintet percussionist Joe Craven trying out the second mandolin part, just like David Nelson did at the Fillmore East. Here's how it sounded with the Jerry Garcia Acoustic Band, Sandy Rothman on mandolin, from Acoustic at the Eel, recorded in 1987 and released in 2019. Ripple in, still warm. There is no pebble talk. New Yorker staff writer Nick Palmgarten. One of the first times I encountered Ripple, I'm, 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 this might be wrong, like this might be anachronistic, but I do remember watching the, the movie Mask. It's the movie with Eric Stoltz. So at, at the end, you know, when he's sort of embraced by the bikers and Ripple plays, and it's a major, like, you know, heart tugging moment. And that was at a time when I saw that where the Grateful Dead were not ubiquitous in popular culture. You know, like I remember Bill Walton after the Celtics won in 1986, you know, they interview him in the, in the locker room and he's like, nothing left to do but smile, smile, smile. And I was like, holy shit, like there's Grateful Dead on TV, you know, like basketball, you know, it's like now it's just like everywhere you go, it's everywhere. But back then it was like, how do they know? Because it was rooted so strongly in the 1970 and 1980 acoustic eras, Ripple isn't really part of the language of deadhead tape collecting in quite the way as most of their best-known songs. For the same reason, not a lot of dead cover bands seem to play it either. But it's a fairly easy-to-remember melody that seems to carry through nearly any setting, and unsurprisingly, there are tons of covers from outside the dead's world. Chris Hillman of The Birds and the Flying Burrito Brothers performed it on 1982's Morning Sky. If my words did glow with the gold of sunshine And my tunes were played on the heart of a strum Jimmy Dale Gilmore, also known as Smokey in The Big Lebowski, on One Endless Night. Did you hear my voice come through the music? Would you hold it near? As were your own. Jesse McReynolds of the McReynolds Brothers on Songs of the Grateful Dead. It's a hand me down. The thoughts are broken. Perhaps they're better left on some. Rick Danko of the band on times like these. I don't know. I don't know. Don't really. To fill the air. Jane's Addiction on the 1991 tribute album Dedicated. The great vocal group, The Persuasions, and might as well, The Persuasions Sing the Dead. There is a road, no simple highway, between the dawn and the dark of night. And if you go, no one may follow, that path is for. Your steps along. Andrew Branch on What If I Told You. Ripple in still water When there is no pebble tossed No wind to blow There are tons. Yola Tango, Wilco, The Walkmen, The Mountain Goats, Built a Spill, and Sarah Louise, to name a few. It took them a few years, but various post-Grateful Dead configurations began to play Ripple as well, including Rat Dog, The Dead, Phil Lesh and Friends, Further, and most recently, Dead and Company. You can find a comprehensive list at deaddisc.com. Some of my very favorite versions of Ripple are by the incredible trumpet player Stephen Bernstein, 
who's performed and recorded two very different arrangements with his group Sex Mob and the Millennial Territory Orchestra. And we'll leave you with bits of those. The Millennial Territory Orchestra first, from MTO Volume 1, then Sex Mob from Solid Sender. How many of you zoomed back in time a little bit when the clip of Eileen Law on the Grateful Dead hotline played? I know it took me right back. I went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame a few years back when they had the Grateful Dead exhibit upstairs, and they had an old landline phone on the wall. You picked up the receiver, put it against your ear, and could listen to a loop recording of one of Eileen's messages. So cool. And... I love that that first show Eileen mentioned in this episode were the Cal State Dominguez Hill shows. I had a sizable crew who camped in my parents' front yard that weekend. Let there be songs to fill the air indeed. Thanks very much for tuning in. Visit us over at dead.net slash deadcast. Spread the love and light. Share this podcast with a friend and a neighbor. See you next episode. Executive producers for the good old Grateful Deadcast, Mark Pincus and Doran Tyson. Produced for Rhino Entertainment by Rich Mahan Productions and Jesse Jarno. Special thanks to David Lemieux. All rights reserved.